Victory. Hey, let's welcome all of our online visitors as they join us live from all over the world. We're just so glad to have you. Every campus is live this weekend, and we are in the third part of our series. We're calling this series Like Him, and we're kind of drilling down on some features of Jesus that sometimes we don't talk a lot about in the church. And uh, this week, we're going to talk about one of my favorite parts of Jesus, which you rarely really hear much about, and that is the passion of Jesus. Now, most of you have seen the film. How many of you have seen the film, The Passion, The Passion of Christ? You know The Passion of Christ is a description of what Jesus did once he entered Jerusalem and as he walked through the suffering and all the trials. But when we're talking about passion, we're not just talking about uh, Jesus going to a cross. We're just talking about something that was inside that fueled him or motivated him beyond his suffering, beyond his trials, and kept him moving forward. It was, it was the fire of the Holy Spirit. And sometimes when I come to church, sometimes I, I, I wonder how much passion do we have in this church? How much passion for Jesus do we have? A lot of times things in the world happen, stuff's going on in our life, private things that just kind of put out the fire. And usually the last thing you hear about in Christmas time is passion. Usually we're caught up in the holidays. We're caught up in shopping for our family. We're going to have family time together. We get caught up in sort of the celebration of Christmas, and we forget about who Jesus really is. So we're going to talk about that, and we're going to drill down. It's going to challenge us today. Y'all ready to get challenged today? My goal is, and by the way, it's not just a goal for here, but all of you that are in the chapel, in all of our overflow rooms, and everyone that's watching us online, my goal is that when we finish today, you're going to have a little fuego inside of you that you didn't walk in with. Amen? Fuego is the Spanish word for fire. Now, last weekend, we had a, a bad weather weekend, and uh, some of you, maybe you, you didn't come last weekend because of the weather. Uh, it was really, really rough on Saturday night. The weather was really stormy. I mean, it was pouring down rain. I, I, you know, if you came on a Saturday night last weekend, you, were, you probably had a little fuego inside of you. But last Saturday night, we also had an event that took place uh, in Atlanta down at the Mercedes-Benz uh, Stadium where Atlanta United won the national championship in soccer, major league championship in soccer. <laughs> And, and we, we should applaud that. It's our only second championship that all Atlanta has ever had in their whole history of their city. We have one Braves World Series. Thank God for that. Never a Super Bowl victory, even though we should have had a Super Bowl victory. And, and never an NBA championship, never even close to an NBA championship. Not sure if that'll ever happen in our lifetime, but... But, but it took the, the Latino community to start moving to Atlanta to create this passion for soccer so that Arthur Blank would buy this soccer team, and in two years, we became the champion. And if you've ever been to an Atlanta United game, it is full of passion. If you watched it online, I went home last night, uh, last Saturday night after the service. I taped it, and I, wa I watched the whole game. I'm not a soccer guy, but I had to watch it because it's the championship, and I've never seen so much passion for a sporting event, for literally people just fervently cheering, standing, beating drums, blowing horns for the whole entire game. They never sat down for the entire game. Not only that, but the weather was atrocious. It was pouring down rain, icy cold, terrible traffic, and people driving through these long lines of traffic, walking up to a mile to get to the game, going in there, just cheering like crazy, staying after the game, cheering like crazy, pouring out onto the field, then walking back through this incredibly bad weather, another mile back to the car, sitting in traffic and going home. Incredible passion. And then Sunday morning came, and it's, it's raining outside. I don't think I'm going to go to church this morning. 
What's up with that? (laughs) What do you have passion for? See, a lot of times somewhere in our journey with God, we kind of lose our passion for the things of God and we have more passion for things in the world. And what ends up happening, it starts to put the fire out inside of us. Let me give you the definition of passion. In the Webster's Dictionary, the word passion means a strong, extravagant feeling towards something, an emotion that motivates us beyond normal existence. When you think about Jesus and you think about his passion, you ask yourself, what is it that motivated Jesus to have this incredible passion while he was on the earth that's far beyond a normal life, a normal existence that drove him all the way to the cross. Can I tell you what Jesus was passionate about more than anything else in life? Here's what Jesus was passionate about. He was passionate about you. He was passionate about you to the point where it drove him through every form of suffering so that you could be saved, so that you could be redeemed from your sins. Hebrews chapter 12 says something about this. I'm gonna read a few verses out of the message uh, paraphrase. And here's what it says in Hebrews 12, 2. It says, keep your eyes on Jesus who both began and finished this race that we're in. You know, a lot of people start the race, but they don't finish it. Study how he did it. How did he finish strong? Because he never lost sight of where he was headed, that exhilarating finish in and with God He could put up with anything along the way, the cross, the shame, whatever. And now he's there in the place of honor right alongside God. When you find yourself flagging in your faith, or I should say losing your passion, go over that story again, item by item, that long litany of hostility that he plowed through, and that will shoot adrenaline into your souls. Now, when Jesus was going through the process of the cross, it was, says it was the joy of, his, of our salvation that drove him through. It was the passion that he had for you and I. Now, if Jesus is that passionate about us, then we have to ask that question, are we passionate about him? Are we as passionate about Jesus as he is about us, or have we traded our passion for things in the world? where we're more passionate about our careers, more passionate about a relationship, more passionate about money, sports, whatever it may be. What I've learned over time as I've been in church for 30-something years is that people operate at different levels of passion in the church. When we have service today, all of us came together in the same service, but we weren't all at the same level of passion for God. There's I think there's four temperatures that people function in when it comes to their passion level in a church service. I think there's the cold level where people come in cold. They, they're not really used to this kind of a church or maybe they have never been in an atmosphere where there's a lot of worship. Maybe they grew up in religion and religion has made them sort of cold to the real passion of Jesus. And so when they come and they're not ready to receive from God, they're not really pressing into the presence of God really could care less. It's irrelevant to them. Church is not really relevant. The second level is the danger level, which is called lukewarm. And if you've read the Bible at all, you know that's not a good place to be. It's, you're neither cold nor hot. In fact, Jesus says this in the book of Revelation in chapter 3 in verse 15. He says, I know your deeds that you're neither cold nor hot. I wish you were one or the other, but because you're lukewarm, neither cold or hot or hot or cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. Uh Uh-oh. You say, I am rich, I've acquired wealth, and I do not need a thing, but you do not realize that you're wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. In other words, you can literally be in a state of life where you think you have it all and you actually have nothing. That's lukewarm. And then there's the third level, which I think some of you may be in, and that's the warm level. And that's where most pastors are pretty happy. When their church is warm, they have a warm community, a warm feeling. The people come to church, they're warm with each other, they give in the church, they serve in the church, they read their Bibles. But there's just a little something that's missing 
in their desire for God where they're not fully consumed with Jesus. They still mix their passion with the world with Jesus. So even though they're good people and they love God, they're not on fire for God. You couldn't say they're on fire. If it's bad weather, they may not come to church. If some circumstance happens, they may drop out. Most, they say most Christians are two weeks away of missing church from backsliding. In other words, they miss two weekends in a row. They start to go backwards instead of forwards. And then the fourth level is the level we're trying to get to, which is the hot level, the fuego level, where you're burning for God, where you're not, an, you're not just a normal Christian, where you give extraordinarily, you love extraordinarily, you serve extraordinarily. You're, just, you're a standout person because you're so on fire for God. Now, in order to understand that, I think there's a scripture that kind of paints the picture in Mark chapter 4, where Jesus tells this parable of the sower. And in this parable, he talks about four levels of Christianity, four levels where people are with God, which we sort of described in the temperature version. And he says, if you can understand uh, this parable, you can understand all the parables in the Bible, but if you don't get this parable, you're going to miss all the parables. You're not going to understand any of them. So it's the parable of parables. It's the most important parable in the Bible. So let's read it. It's Mark chapter 4, verse 13. It says, And he said to them, Do you not understand this parable? How then will you understand any or all of the parables? The sower sows the word, and these are the ones by the wayside where the word is sown. And when they hear, Satan comes immediately, takes away the word that was sown in their hearts. These likewise are the ones sown on stony ground, who when they hear the word, immediately they receive it with gladness. But they have no root in themselves, and so endure only for a time. Sometimes I meet people like this in the lobby at church. They'll come up to me and they'll go, Dennis, I'm so excited about this church. I love this church. It's so on fire for God, and I just I'm, I can't wait to join the church. I'm going to be a member of this church. I'm going to serve in this church. I'm going to be a. I just can't wait. I love this church, and then I never see them again. They get excited for a moment in a sermon or a service. Maybe they even answer an invitation to Christ. But later on that week, something happens, some circumstance happens that rocks their boat, gets them upset, gets them frustrated or offended or whatever, and you never see them again. How many people have you seen like that? They start, but they don't finish because they have no roots in themselves. And then he says the third level, which I think... Maybe a lot of us could fall into this category. It says, these are ones sown among thorns. They're the ones who hear the word and the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches and the desire for other things enter in and choke the word and it becomes unfruitful. In other words, he says, you've navigated the first two levels. You're not, you're not an uncaring person. You love Jesus and you're not just an emotional Christian. You're a little bit more stabilized than that. But as you start your walk with God, the enemy's last ditch effort is to choke the word out of you through cares of the world, deceitfulness of riches, and lust for things. It could be any of those three, or it could be all three of those. And he said, these are the things that take most Christians out of the passion of Christ. They stop being passionate because they have trouble at their job. Their marriage is going through some challenges. They just have a baby. Just different things happen in their life, and they just sort of get caught up in those things, and they lose their fire for God. They stop being passionate about the things of God, and that's exactly where the enemy wants them. And then you have this fourth group, and he says, these are the ones that are sown on good ground, who hear the word, accept it, bear fruit, some 30-fold, some 60, and some 100 I was reading a book by A.W. Tozier about passion, and here's what he says. He said, God dwells in a state of perpetual enthusiasm. He is delighted with all that is good and lovingly concerned about all that is wrong. He pursues his labors always in a fullness of holy zeal. No wonder the Spirit came at Pentecost as a sound of a rushing mighty wind and sat as tongues of fire on every forehead. Whatever else happened at Pentecost, one thing that cannot be missed by the most casual observer was the sudden upsurging of moral enthusiasm. Those first disciples burned with the steady inward fire 
They were enthusiastic to the point of complete abandon. Now, we just had an experience here before I came to preach called worship, it's a worship experience, where we came to church to, to start the service, and we always start with worship. We don't start with the preaching because we want to make sure that we thank God and help our, each of us to get closer to God in the presence of God. So the, the type of worship experience that you just had determines many times the presence of God in your life. As you enter into this place of worship, it starts to increase or not increase the presence of God. And everyone comes in at a different level depending on what's going on in their life. The best way I can describe it is describe when you take water and you pour it into a, a container and you start heating up the water. And as you start heating up the water, it starts to get warmer. Let's say it gets to 180 degrees. That's pretty hot. You feel like that's hot. But what most people know is nothing transforms in 180 degrees. It's not until you get the water to 212 degrees that you see a transformation. Once the heat gets to the point of 212, it moves from just water to a different composition. So if you throw an egg in 180 degree water, it'll warm the egg, but it'll still be the same inside. It won't change. If you heat it up to 212, it changes the composition of the egg and it boils the egg into a hard boiled egg. In a service, you have different degrees of people wanting the presence of God. You have some people that are cold, could care less about the presence of God. You have some people that are lukewarm and they're standing there with their arms folded. You have some that are warm, they're clapping, they're singing. And then you have some that are on fire for God. Usually they're sitting somewhere up around the front of the church. There you are. And I watch the people at the front and the people at the front tend to worship a little bit stronger than the people in other parts of the building. And I'm not dogging you if you're in the back. There may be good reasons why you're back there because you had to sit somewhere. And some of you are in the chapel and you know why you're in the chapel. You know why you're in there. We're not, we don't want you there, but we know why you're there. And, and, and the, the reality is, is and, and it's hard to imagine this, but they've done studies in, in churches and this is why the big sanctuaries sometimes don't get this. But you build a sanctuary at a certain size, there's a certain distance from the stage where the fire starts to dissipate, where the communication begins to get weaker, and the farther back you are, the more likely you are going to get distracted during the service. I remember the first time we played a video, we have a screen that sometimes we, if I'm too tired at the one o'clock service, they'll play that. And the first time we did it, I wanted to feel what it felt like in the service with the video screen down, so I sat in the very back. I had never sat in the back of the church in my life because I've always up here. And so I'm sitting there in the back, and I sit down, and of course, the screen comes down, and I'm preaching here on the stage, but I'm sitting back there. And the people that are sitting next to me are kind of like... <laughs> they didn't know because it looked like I was up on the stage. It was real life on the stage. If you've never experienced it, it's kind of interesting. But I, I remember, I sat through the whole message, and I remember just thinking, man, this is so distracting. People back here, they're on their cell phones, they're texting each other, they're looking around. And I said, it's not always that way, but, but when you're on the front, you just can't do that. You just can't. Everybody's looking at you up here. But the heat of the service or the passion of the service is determined by the people in the service. It's not determined by God just showing up. He shows up when we want him, when we pursue him. Amen? So the best way I can describe it is kind of like building a fire with wood. You have different kinds of wood that you can build a fire with or try to build a fire with. So I got a little illustration here. I went out in my backyard yesterday, and I just pulled out some different kinds of wood. So, for example, there's green wood. And green wood is new wood, it's young wood, it's wood that is hard to light. You would think it looks like, oh, we can light that right up, but it's actually got moisture in it because it's new, it's fresh, it's new. 
And basically, moisture represents the world inside of our lives. And the more world we have inside of us, the less likely we are to be on fire for God. And what happens with Greenwood is it takes a little time for that to be seasoned and mature before it's ready to ignite. So you don't start a fire with Greenwood. There's another kind of wood that sometimes we see, and I, I found this in my backyard. This is wet wood. This is wood that's been sitting out in the rain for the last couple of days, and even though it looks to you like it's dry, it's actually full of water. It's not completely saturated, but it's not the kind of wood you would start a fire with because it's got water saturated inside of it, and this water represents religion. Religion sometimes becomes a replacement for our relationship with God. And what happens with religion, I don't know if you grew up with it, but I grew up with it, where when I came into the presence of God because I had so much religion in me, it put the fire out. It made me resist the Holy Spirit. It made me want to snuff out anything that brought emotion up with me towards Jesus and said, calm down, calm down, just get back into your religious box. I grew up in the Baptist box. I don't know what box you grew up in. I grew up in the First Baptist of McDonough, Georgia box. And it was a good church. I mean, they loved God, but they didn't have the presence of God with the Holy Spirit. They didn't even talk about the Holy Spirit. And many times whenever you would talk about it, they would snuff it out with religion. And this is the biggest enemy to Jesus. If you remember when Jesus was on the scene, the people that got the most frustrated with Jesus and the person, people that Jesus was the most frustrated with were the religious people. Because every time he would do miracles, he would cast out demons, he would heal sick people, they would bring up some religious ideology or theology to try to snuff it out. You're doing this on the Sabbath. You're breaking the Sabbath laws. Who are you to say that you're a God? And they would bring all these religious things out. And what happens if you come into a church with religion, it starts to put out the passion of God in your life. And then... There's this other kind of wood that sometimes we are not aware of, but it's very present. It's called charred wood. Charred wood used to be on fire. This is representative of people that used to be on fire, but somewhere in their journey, the fire went out. Circumstances, lust of the world, cares of the world, you know, just different things puts the fire out, or they got hurt in church. They burn out because of offenses, because of maybe overworking, nobody appreciating them. Maybe they get frustrated. They start reading stuff online about how bad the church is. And what happens to charred Christians is they get critical of the church. They begin to find fault with the church. And so they walk in, literally, any church they go to visit, what's wrong with this church? They come in with the attitude, something's wrong. It's too big. There's too many people here. There's got to be something wrong. It's kind of like the Jerry Seinfeld episodes. Jerry Seinfeld is one of my favorite comedians. And every time he would date a girl, he was always thinking in the back of mind, there's got to be something wrong with her. <laughs> That's why he never got married in the scenes, because he was always looking for the wrong. Sometimes people come into church like this. They're charred. And you can't light a fire with charred wood. Charred wood will just smolder and complain and find fault and find reasons why I can't be on fire for God because of those people over there called Christians. When you start blaming your relationship with God on other people, you're charred wood. But then there's this other kind of wood, and I'm hoping all of you will eventually become, called kindling wood. Kindling wood is wood that's seasoned, that's dry, that's been delivered from the water of the world, and in fact, now is saturated with the water of the word. And the water of the word doesn't put the word out. It's like kerosene on the wood. The more words you put in, the more combustible you become. And when you start to saturate yourself in the kerosene of the word, then it doesn't take a second for you to go after God. When you start coming into the presence of God, you start to get on fire, you understand that the fire of God burns up all the chaff in your life. 
It gets all the junk out of your life and you're no longer filled with the world because you're full of God. Now, what would happen if all of you were this kind of wood? What would happen? Can I tell you what would happen if you've ever been to a thirst service in our church? How many of you have been to a thirst service in our church? Those of you that have never been to a thirst service, remember these other three kinds of wood? They don't go to thirst services. <laughs> thirst services are not interesting to them. Football is more interesting or watching HGTV is more interesting or being a shopper or something more interesting than, than the thirst service. But thirst service is where we gather together not to hear the preaching of the word, but just to get the presence of God in the room. And when people come to thirst, they're giving up an extra time where they would normally not come to service, usually a Sunday night, and they make a track over here, rain or shine, and it never fails. It's a full room of people, not the whole church, but a portion of the church that has decided we're going to be kindling tonight, and we're just going to go after the presence of Jesus. And when they go to thirst, here's what happens. If they've got sickness in their bodies, this is where a lot of healings start taking place. Not in the preaching, but in the presence of God. This is where deliverances take place. This is where people get on fire for God. And what happens is, and, and I don't know about you, but sometimes when I've got to come back for thirst, I'm so tired, but I come back and I go, I'm so glad I came, even though I was tired, because there's a refreshing in the presence of God that you get, and it starts to fill you up with new passion. Now, the goal of God is to get every one of us looking like this. Get the water out of our wood. Come on, somebody. Get the greenness out of our wood. Get the char out of our wood. And get us on fuego so that when we come to church, it's like an Atlanta United soccer game championship so that people are coming in and they're worshiping Jesus as much as they're cheering for a sports team. Come on. Some of you men need to learn how to worship Jesus as much as you cheer for a football team or a basketball team or a soccer team. Yes, yes, we do. <laughs> All right, so what temperature are you at right now? If you were to really be honest with God, where do you think you are? Are you cold? Are you warm, lukewarm, or are you hot? Let me tell you how to get hot. If you're not there, let me tell you how to get there. This is the journey that God took me on years and years ago when I first got saved. Now, now, you have to understand, I'm a little different. I'm a little different than a, the average person because I, before Christ, was a radical sinner. Just let that set in for a moment. I know, it's hard to understand that. When people find out that I'm an actual pastor of a church that knew me before Christ, they find out that, they, it's, just, it's just too much for them to even digest. I cannot digest you are a preacher because they knew me before Christ. And so before Christ, I was a radical sinner. There was nothing beyond my desire of wanting to do crazy things. I was just crazy. I was crazy sinner. I mean, it was, there wasn't a day or a night that I didn't do something radical for, for myself or for sin. And then when I got saved, when I got radically saved, that radicalness didn't go away. I just shifted it from sin to Jesus. So I'm going to share with you a little bit about how it processed in my life, but it's not normal for most people to have these experiences. But I, I began my journey with Jesus. And what happened is I started realizing that there was some areas of my life, if I was going to be passionate about God as much as he was passionate about me, I was going to have to change some of my patterns of life. So here's the first thing that I learned. As I started studying Jesus and his passion, I learned in order to have true passion for God like Jesus has for us, you have to learn to press in to the fullness of the Holy Spirit, the fullness of the Holy Spirit. Now, every day we have opportunities to press in to the fullness of the Holy Spirit, but I can almost guarantee you, you will have all kinds of reasons and distractions that will keep you from doing that. And those distractions will eventually take the place of the Holy Spirit, and it'll start to put the fire out inside of you. So when you study the life of Jesus, you remember Jesus would get up early in the morning, and he would press in to the fullness of the Holy Spirit because he knew 
that all of his power, all of his anointing came from the Holy Spirit. Whenever you see the supernatural functioning in Jesus, it was the Holy Spirit functioning through Jesus. He would say things, I can of my own self do nothing. And then he would say things like this in John 14, 12, the works that I'm doing, you will also do because I'm going to the Father and I'm gonna send you a helper and his name is the Holy Spirit. So I want you to think this morning when you got up, what was your connection to the Holy Spirit? How did you connect with him this morning? Is it possible that you got up and ignored the third person of the Trinity and went about your day never considering that the fire and the passion of Jesus is found in the presence of the Holy Spirit? The passion and fire of Jesus, if you want it in your home, there has to be a pursuit of the Holy Spirit in your home. If you want it in your children, you're gonna have to teach your children how to pursue the presence of the Holy Spirit. I was reading along and John makes this statement in the book of Matthew chapter three, verse 11. He says, I'm gonna baptize you here in the river, turning your old life in for a kingdom life, but the real action comes next. The main character in this drama compared to him, I'm a mere stagehand, will ignite the kingdom life within you a fire within you, the Holy Spirit within you, changing you from the inside out. A man came up to me in a shopping mall one day, a few, day, few weeks, a few months after I got saved, and he said to me, he said, uh, I noticed you're reading your Bible here. He said, uh, have you been filled with the Holy Spirit? And I said, well, I'm not even sure what you're talking about. I've never been taught about being filled with the Holy Spirit. I, I know Jesus, I got saved, I know the Holy Spirit is inside me. And he says, no, he says, I'm not talking about the Holy Spirit coming to live within you when you get saved. I'm talking about the Holy Spirit coming upon you to empower you for service. Have you had that experience? I said, well, I grew up in the Baptist church. They told me that passed away. That was no longer for today. And he said, exactly. The denominational settings many times shut down the power of the Holy Spirit because it doesn't make sense to their natural minds. And therefore, the church many times doesn't function in the fullness of what Jesus wants us to function in. Every miracle, every healing, every raising of the dead, every deliverance came as a result of the fullness of the Holy Spirit in Jesus. He was constantly pressing into his presence. And he said, do you want that? And I remember just saying to him, you know what? I don't know what it means to be baptized in the Holy Spirit, but I want everything that God wants for me. How many of you want everything that God wants for you? I don't wanna shut it down because it doesn't make sense or it's scary or it's weird or tongues or whatever. I don't wanna shut that down. If it's in the Bible and people operated with it, I want it. I want it. And, if, and, and, I, and I said, I want it. So he said, okay, I'm gonna pray for you. So he we went to my hotel room and he prayed for me that night and I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit and something began to change in the composition of my connection with God, where now suddenly I begin to hear God more clearly, I begin to believe God more powerfully, I begin to operate in the gifts of the Spirit, which I'd never operated in before, I begin to function in praying for sick people, delivering people, I'd never seen that operate, and once that started happening, the passion of God began to rise inside of me, and I realized that that's a daily experience with God, that every day we have the opportunity to be filled with the Holy Spirit, but, in, but instead, many times, we fill ourselves with other things. We fill ourselves with the news. We fill ourselves with uh, meaningless conversations on the internet. We fill ourselves with things that don't build us up in the Holy Spirit, and so therefore, many times, our passion begins to dissipate. How you doing with the presence of the Holy Spirit? Second thing is, you begin to exchange the love of the world for the love of the things of God. The love of the world for the, things of, the love of the things of God. Now, again, I'm an old school guy. I, I was, as I said, I was a radical sinner. So when I got saved, I, I went a little bit old school and radical on myself. And I started taking a look around what's in my life that has been influencing me away from God. And the first thing I saw was music. I had a 
real strong connection to music. I had every kind of album. Back in those days, you had albums. We didn't have any downloads. You know, we actually had s- cylinders that you put on a, a record player and you actually played it on a record. I know some of you have never seen those before, but that's how we used to listen to music. And then we had eight track tapes. That's how old I am, eight track. Then we had cassette tapes. And so I had a collection of all those things. And I remember I just rounded them all up, everything. I didn't take time to inventory. I just took it all, put it in some boxes, thousands and thousands of dollars of music. And I'm walking out to the dumpster, and Colleen says, don't you think I ought to just give it to somebody? I said, if it's no good for me, it's not good for anybody else. So I just put it in the dumpster. I just dumped it all in the dumpster. And then I took all the alcohol that I had accumulated over many years of time, put it in the dumpster. I just threw it all out. I just threw it all out. And I said, I've got to disconnect myself from the world for a season, completely disconnect from anything that was influencing me so that I can get closer to Jesus. I find that most Christians won't do that. Most Christians will make excuses of why they don't need to do that, that's not important, and they don't realize that it's controlling their life. Nowadays, if you look at nowadays, what are the major things that fill us that take the place of the Holy Spirit come across the internet where we get on our smartphones and our iPads and we get absorbed in social media and social media becomes our substitute for the Bible. Our information comes from the social media platforms that we connect ourselves to, Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, anything like that or even the news media on social media. Our friendships are formed on social media. Everything's formed on social media. I was doing a study on social media about smartphones, and they were saying that since the advent of smartphones has come on the market, that a child, when they start on a smartphone, it rewires their brain, and it makes them more likely to get depressed. 27% of children now are depressed because of their connection to smartphones, They're fighting depression like they never fought it before. Suicide rates have run through the the sky because of bullying and relational issues that happen on social media. Now they're saying that Bill Gates and uh, Steve Jobs, all the creators of the computer industry, they studied their life and they found out that even though they're the inventors of the smartphones and all the programming of the smartphones, they didn't let their children have them. They didn't let their children have them. They, they raised their children outside of the, the, the internet. And, and they put their children in schools, special schools that didn't include tablets or smartphones. That ought to tell you something. We hand them out like they're candy. At Christmas time, our kids are 10 years old. They want a smartphone. I'm going to say something that's controversial. Is maybe you won't agree with it, and I don't care if you agree. I'm 61 years old. I don't care whether you agree with it or not. <laughs> Sometimes it's good to have an old pastor. I don't care. I love you, but I don't really care if it, if it bothers you. But here's the bottom line. If I was re-raising my daughter right now, and, I, and I, I did raise her without a smartphone, but if I was re-raising her today, I wouldn't give her a smartphone. I wouldn't give her a smartphone. I would wait till she's mature enough to handle that kind of information because when you give a child a smartphone, you're giving a, a, a child access to pornography, to violence, to cyberbullying, to information, to relationships that you don't even know. You're giving them access to that freely. You're giving, the Bible calls one of the names for Satan is the prince of the power of the air. And you just give them full access to these things with no, no abilities to stop it because you say, well, I got guards on it. Let me tell you something. Kids know how to get around your guards. There are some technological geniuses out there in school, and they can take your kid's phone, and they can rewire it and reconfigure it so that that all your guards don't do any good. Amen. And so there's some good things about smartphones that I like. I like the Life 360 where you can know where your kid is at all the times. I love that. If you don't have that, that's a great app on a phone. But I would never hand a smartphone to a teenager. I would give them a cell phone because I want to be able to connect with them, and they'd be able to text me. But smartphones are an open door to an, to an arena that they're not mature enough to handle yet. Now, don't ask them if they're mature enough. They will tell you they're mature enough. But really, the bottom line is, 
a smartphone is danger zone. And it steals the affections of our heart. We get addicted to it. It says now most kids are addicted to smartphones. They're addicted to them. They can't go a few minutes. Now Vitamin Water, as a new company, came out with this new uh, challenge to America that we'll give a person in America $100,000 if they can go a whole year without using a smartphone. You can make your application tomorrow. You have to make an application, pass through the test, but you can't use a smartphone or a tablet. You can use a computer in your home, but can't use a smartphone. Now, why would they make that challenge? Because they know how addicted we are to them. We become so addicted, and then our whole lives become filled with the internet instead of Jesus. Y'all all right out there? This is why John says this. In John, 1 John 2, 15, do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love for the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. All right, so you have to ask ourselves, how much am I engaging uh, in the world that is putting out the fire for Jesus in my life? When I get up in the morning, is the first thing I do is go on my smartphone to play a game or look on the internet for who's liking me on Facebook or who's got some cool video. All right. They say the number one aspiration now of teenagers is not to go to college, but to create a YouTube video channel that people will watch about themselves. It's the number one goal of young people today. We're living in a different world today, and it's a battle. It's a war, and the passion begins to dissipate when we start to trade world for Jesus, amen? All right, so that's the second thing. You've gotta trade that. And then the third thing is you gotta hang out with fire starters instead of firefighters. All you gotta do is take a look at your friends, the ones up close, and ask yourself, are they lighting a fire in you for Jesus or are they throwing a wet blanket on you for Jesus? Are they challenging you to serve God or are they pulling you back from God? And are you either, you're either being lit for, pe- for God or you're being put out for God? You know, there's all, the, I'm lit, I'm lit. What does that mean? <laughs> you're lit, you're lit with what? <laughs> I have no idea what that means. I really don't. But I know this, if you're lit for God, you're hanging out with fire starters. You're surrounded by people, which means, and this is what, I think this is what comes into play with Jesus, where he said, if you're going to follow me, you're going to have to be willing to forsake even your own family members. Even your own family members. I remember my grandmother, she said, she said, you know, the Bible's nothing but a bunch of fairy tales. Not a bunch, it's just a bunch of fairy tales. And and I remember that. And And I went to church with her and sure enough, they, they preached in her church seven ways to grow old gracefully. She said, they don't talk about the Bible. And, and when, when we left, she looked at me and she smiled. She said, see, <laughs> see, they don't talk about the Bible in this church. And she tried to put out the fire. And I said, grandmother, I love you, but I, I got to follow Jesus. I, I can't let you be my guide. I got to let Jesus be my guide. You think about your young people, what puts their fire out more than anything is their friends. And you have something to do with that. Your friends also speak loudly of your fire. Are they fire starters or firefighters? And then finally, number four, that you have to decide to live a life that really matters. I remember having this conversation with my daughter when she was uh, graduating from high school in 2005. And uh, we were just talking about how you navigate college, you stay on fire for God, just some of the ways that you know, you don't backslide, and she navigated it through high school, but I didn't want her fire to go out, and I knew that it's possible you get into college, and the college environment can really affect your fire, and so I said, I suggested to her, you might want to take a gap year and spend it on the mission field, giving yourself to Jesus for a year, and just getting in environments that are outside of the bubble of our home and our family and our church 
so that you can experience some challenges in life and also learn what it's like to be a Christian in some challenging areas like Europe. She was going to Europe. In Europe, from the middle of Europe down, every country is less than 1% Christian. That's hard for you to even comprehend that unless you're from Europe. But in France, Germany, many of these countries, Italy, Spain, less than 1% Christian. And the only reason you have even 1% Christian is because of Nigerians moving to Europe. I'm just telling you right now. You should, the Nigerians, are the hold, they're holding the standard of Christianity in Europe. They're the only group that's really has decent-sized churches. If you hear of a big church in Europe, it's usually a Nigerian church. What can I say about you Nigerians? You love Jesus. You love Jesus. You have something in your culture that pushes you through all that stuff, all that European uh, stuff that tries to talk you out of Jesus. And so what happens is, is Europe is kind of a slow death. It's dying a slow death to God. It's, it's a godless continent, really. And at the northern part of Europe, it's a little bit more. And so I sent, we sent her to Norway, where she's trained for three months. And then she spent the last nine months traveling with uh, seven other students, uh, young people, evangelizing Europe, doing different kinds of presentations of the gospel, and did, did the World Cup, different things like that. And when she came back, there was a awareness and a fire that had been deposited in her from just exercising her faith and doing something that made a difference instead of just going through the motions of getting an education. We have a college here, in case you didn't know that, we have Atlanta Leadership College here, where we take the top 100, 110 students from around the country that apply, and we train them. They actually have college credits. They get two years of college credits if they go two years. And they also get trained in their character, in their foundation. They go on mission trips. They do all the things so that they have that seasoning preparing them for going to secular college before they go to college. So when Lauren came back, she went to God's College, University of Georgia. She was ready. She was on fuego. Didn't backslide in college. Think about that, parents. Sometimes we exalt education over passion for Jesus. We put getting a good job over a relationship with Jesus. Did you hear what I just said? Nigerians, <laughs> Koreans, Chinese. Some of you exalt education above a relationship with Jesus in your homes. And that's a dangerous place to be with your children. I see, I praised you, but then I also <laughs> put a little something else out there to remind you we all have strengths and we all have weaknesses. Amen, in our culture. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now think about this. Think about you growing up and your passion for Jesus as you're going through the, all these processes as a young person. It's likely, it's likely that you lived a life where most of your life you were not on fire for God. You were either wet wood, green wood, charred wood. You, you could... You weren't necessarily on fire for God, and now you're trying to play some catch-up. The only way you're going to do that, listen, is you got to reevaluate what you're doing with your life. you got to look at what you're doing. Take a hard look at what you're doing. Don't work a job just for money. Don't work a job just for money. Do something with your life that makes a difference. It's not that you can't make a difference in the job market. Certainly you can. A business person, a nurse, a doctor, somebody who does something politically. These are all difference-making kind of positions. But I'm just saying, don't work a job that has no meaning. It'll put your fire out. You've got to get your life wrapped around something that when your life is over, it mattered when you're being buried, your family's not going home, and the first thing out of their mouth is, where's the potato salad? <laughs> they actually cared that you lived. The world knew you were here. You made a difference. You are not called to blend in. You're called to be salt and light in this world. <laughs> Passionate people will not settle for anything that doesn't make a difference. 
They are never wrapped up in the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, and the lust of other things. That's not their life. Their life is built around, I want to do something in life that makes a difference. I don't want to get in the game of life. I want to get in the game of changing lives. I want to change lives in whatever game, whatever game I'm playing. Now, can you imagine if you had a church filled with people who were pursuing the presence of the Holy Spirit, who were trading the love of the world for the thing, love of the things of God, and who were really pursuing something that made a difference in their life? They were exchanging their relationships from firefighters to fire uh, lighters, people who light the fire inside of them. Can you imagine what a church like that could do? Our limitations are always tied into our passion. Our passion. What we're passionate about. You can tell what you're passionate about every day. What dominates your thoughts, what dominates your time, what dominates your energy, your emotions. That's what you're passionate about. And what I'm trying to get you to see is the most important thing with Jesus is Jesus was passionate about the things of God. And if we're gonna be like him, we've gotta start pressing in to the fullness of who he was. I want you to take a moment, close your eyes, bow your heads, and I want you to think about that. You may be here today and you recognize that maybe you've let some of the fire go out inside of you. It could happen through circumstances in your life, something changed in your life, challenges you're having, just the lack of reading the word, the lack of prayer life, just different things like that where your fire has started to dissipate and you've kind of made excuses for it and settled into sort of a half-hearted, warm or lukewarm relationship with Jesus. God brought you here today, brought you here just to hear this message. This is for you. So that when you leave today, you don't leave living that same way. You decide, I'm, I'm making some changes in my life. When I leave here today, I don't want to just go back into my old lifestyle. I want to start pursuing the presence of the Holy Spirit in my life. I want to get anything out of my life that's worldly, that's hindering my passion for Jesus. I want to start hanging around with people that will charge me and draw me upward towards God. And I want to get into a life that makes a difference. I wanna do something with my life that actually counts. So Father, would you speak to us, both here in the chapel, in our overflow family rooms, speak to us about these things, and would you help us now to make consecrated decisions that we're not gonna settle for a lukewarm relationship with you, Jesus. If you're here today and you say, I need to make some changes, wherever you are, whatever you room you're in or whatever place you are, whether you're watching us online, you say, I need to make some changes. I just want you to acknowledge it by lifting your hand, saying, that's me, Jesus. That's me. I'm not going to settle for a half-hearted relationship with you. I'm going to lead us in a confession, and then we're going to just close with an act of worship where we go after God. Let's say this together. Jesus, right now, I just repent of any lukewarmness in my heart, any sin in my life, any half-heartedness, I ask you to forgive me. And Jesus, today, I want to start a new journey with you. I want to press into the presence of the Holy Spirit. I want to make some trade-offs in my life of the world for more of God. Thank you for helping me to change my relationships. God, thank you for guiding me into something that makes a difference. I praise you, Jesus, and I'm asking you to fill me with the fullness of the Holy Spirit. Give me a new fire for the things of God. Help me awaken my heart. Help me to get charged for you, Jesus, and that from this day forward, never letting that fire go out again. In Jesus' name. And everybody that agrees with that prayer says amen and amen. Come on, let's stand to our feet. Let's go after him right now. Come on.